My name's Anna Starling and I'm a Policy Fellow at the Health Foundation and today I'm going to talk about the Multi-Specialty Community Provider Framework. We all know that health services have to change to meet the challenges of an ageing population and more people living with long-term conditions. That includes breaking down the historical divides between primary, community, mental health, acute and social services and bringing specialised care closer to home. That's why the multi-specialty community provider model is important and why the Health Foundation was encouraged by the publication of the MCP framework earlier this summer. The framework does recognise though that an MCP can't simply be willed into being because of the complexity and scale of the changes required and that's an important point. Well, an MCP is a provider that brings together primary care services, community services, social care in a transformed way and it's about bringing those services together on a population basis so that in the case of Dudley, the way we look at this, it's about bringing teams of people together for a shared responsibility for the same shared population. For us it starts with the patient registered with a practice and we've organised our model of care around that basis because in the NHS everyone is registered with a GP and they look to the GP as the lead coordinator for the care in the community and we've designed the services around the themes that the population are looking for from us which is about better access to services through their GP initially um, or their GP services associated with that it's about better continuity of care around long-term conditions management and it's also about better coordination of care, particularly for those people with complex needs. And all of that starts with a patient registered with a practice, which is why we've developed an MCP model which has general practice at the heart of it. Looking at the multi-speciality community provider um, from a patient perspective, um, I would hope there will be advantages um, in the future um, so that with all of those organisations, both from the NHS um, and the Council, um, together with voluntary organisations all working together, um, that hopefully if I ever need support um, as a patient with long-term conditions, that whoever I talk to first, whether that's uh, a voluntary sector group or it might be my GP more realistically, that I'll only have to tell my story once, um, as all the records will be shared. Um, um, so if I've had x-rays or scans, they'll be able to be accessed by anybody. I'll also have my own records, because I want to take responsibility for my own health, um, so that I'm as fully informed as possible. So I see the MCPs as really pioneering that way, really getting... Um, organisations to really work together so that I won't get um, what sometimes happens, oh well we can't do that, you'll have to go back to your GP again and get referred elsewhere, but that somebody will link me with something um, or help me access that from elsewhere. The other thing that I think is different um, about the MCPs and the other vanguards is the desire to really work um, with patients, people and their communities um, at a very early stage to have them help inform what is decided, what does get changed, how things work. Um, I know that um, as somebody with um, quite a lot of lived experience now of different conditions um, that I see things differently as a patient and I'd like to share what I see um, with the people who are designing um, or changing how things might be. So I think it's really important um, to engage your patients, public and the communities you serve um, at the very earliest opportunity in a really meaningful way. And this is different to just ordinary consultation or ordinary um, engagement. Um, and I think whether you call it co-design or co-production, um, it really is the way to go because it really does make a difference. I do some work with the Coalition for Collaborative Care and sit on the People and Communities Board. We're working obviously with the voluntary sector and in partnership with patients and the public is absolutely crucial and will help make those shifts, both for um, efficiencies um, so that things aren't provided which aren't necessary or duplicate, but also to get that quality right. 
Um, so that it's really about what matters to me in my life. Um, and to help that, um, there is a, a model that's been developed by the Coalition for Collaborative Care and the NHS, a very simple one side of A4, looking at the values and principles. So for any, whether that's a group, organisation, or for parents to or for patients to share as well, that can helpfully be a starting point. I would hope that in the future, um, all of the work that's being done will mean that there will be better quality of support, um, whether that's in organisations or from groups, and that it will be not only integrated, but it will be coordinated as well, as well um, and really help me in what matters to me. Hello, my name is Louise Watson and I'm the multi-specialty community provider national lead within the Nuclear Models Programme. I'm here to talk to you today about the multi-specialty community provider care model and what it means to you and how you might be able to develop within your local community. The model itself is a population health based model. That means the focus of the model is the patient and how the patient interacts with their local community. What I mean by that is that the whole model is focused on the neighbourhood and how the patient works, lives and actually gains their health and social care provision within that neighbourhood. The focal point of the model is the GP and their GP registered list and therefore the model is built out from the GP into the neighbourhood and then into any hospital or community services that are then required to support the provision of healthcare for that patient. In terms of things that we have learned along the way in the 18 months that we have been working with the Vanguard sites and with the New Care Models programme, there are three, three things that I would like to point out to you. The first being that it is essential that the partnerships are aligned within any community. What I mean by that is that health and social care partners and organisations have the same understanding of what they are trying to do in terms of the development of the care model and that they are aligned within their strategic intent and that they have a plan which articulates this over a period or course of one to two years. The second aspect that I'd want to draw your attention to is actually clarity around the care model itself. It is essential that all partners understand how they're going to develop the care model, what the care model looks like and also how that will benefit their patients and how they are going to involve their patients and their community in the development of that care model. I would recommend you use the framework and also use those vanguards and new care models teams who have developed the programme initially to support you in doing this. The final aspect that I would commend to you is the development of a robust programme office and programme management functionality. This will keep track of where you are going will enable you to understand the risks and challenges that you face in developing the care model and also enable you to understand the return on investment that you will need to ensure that the care model is safe, efficient, effective and of a high quality for your population. Thank you. So my name is Michael Laurie. I'm uh, an analyst in NHS England and I'm overseeing the evaluation of the new care model programme. So I've been asked to talk about what a logic model is to begin with. Um, well, a logic model, it comes from the field of programme evaluation, policy and programme evaluation. Uh, it's a, 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 a methodological tool um, that most evaluations will use and the, the government sort of recommends their use when one comes to um, evaluate a, a piece of work you're doing. And logic models are based on the premise that at, at their heart, every, every, pro every program or policy or intervention is, is, is a theory of change. It's a theory of, of doing things better or addressing a, a social challenge or a social, uh, a social ill. And a, a logic model is a, an attempt to encapsulate this um, this theory of change in, into, a, into a diagram, into a single uh, diagram. It links the, uh, the inputs to that program, so the resourcing or the, um, the skills that have maybe gone into it, 
with the activities that are being funded, what is the programme actually doing? Is it a training programme? Is it, uh, as, as with the new care models, is it trying to uh, bring in population health approaches um, with the, uh, the, the end benefit that those uh, programmes deliver? So it links those three concepts together inside one diagram, um, uh, which then has a range of other uh, uses thereafter. If you get the right people around the table for your programme at the right time, you know, early in the programme when your care models are at a sort of nascent stage in its development, if you get analysts, policy people, uh, pro programme leads, and of course clinical staff around the table to think through the detail of what the, you know, how you might go from A to B, um, uh, you know, we found in the Vanguard programme that that, that that had massive massive benefit for the, uh, the programme itself. Um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely benefit to the end product, but we really think there's benefit to the, the process of, produce, of, of, of developing the logic model as well. Okay, so where, where can you go to produce one of these? Well, from the center, from us, there are, you know, we've learned things about, about producing logic models through the Vanguard program. Um, so the first place to look is, is, is the Vanguard logic models and we can make sure that they're easily accessible. We've, we've, we've learned about, about the process as well and there's a, a learning paper produced there. But that's, you know, that's only gonna take you so far. I think what I'd advise is to start thinking about evaluation an, an analysis of your program from the beginning. Um, how are you going to measure, in effect, if what you're proposing has, has worked? So to do, you know, you might you want to, to, to find out people who can do evaluations for you. Um, and, the, and the obvious place to start are your local universities. But we know that the commissioning support units can can help with this too. Academic health science networks and and there's also. Uh, you know, consulting firms who, who specialise in this sort of work too. Um, so there's plenty, plenty of expertise out there who can, who can help you to begin with. Well, if you take a patient with uh, complex needs, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't want a siloed response. They want a response that deals with their whole needs. So in Dudley and in many MCPs, We've developed uh, multidisciplinary teams based in the community, which is coordinated by the GP, but includes a social worker, a mental health worker, a district nurse, a pharmacist, also particularly impo important links to the voluntary sector. And what those teams do is they work as one for a shared group of patients to take a shared responsibility. And they, because they're working as one team, they're able to provide a holistic response that meets their whole needs as a person again, rather than an individual siloed response. Well, I think if you look at uh, the last decade and a half, what we saw was a transformation of secondary care, which really delivered phenomenal improvements in, for example, waiting times, but also in terms of outcomes. And uh, what the MCP is about is the transformation of the other half of the system. Um, in the past, we've had all those services separated, um, disconnected, not as one, and the MCP brings together all of those disconnected services to create a transformed primary and community service. The model is a population health-based health and social care model. What we talk about within this model is four different aspects. The first aspect is the extensivist aspect of the model. This deals with the most high intensity users of health and care services and we look at this through patient segmentation and through risk stratification. Um, it usually applies to about the top 2 or 3 percent of the population and specific health and care services will be put in place for that individual related to their specific health and care needs. The second aspect of the model is the enhanced and extended primary and community care services. What we mean by this is that services will be in place within the community and the neighbourhood where that patient lives 
to look after them, be they having long-term conditions or a condition that is exacerbated um, through no fault of their own. This means that care will be wrapped around the patient and that multidisciplinary teams of professionals such as pharmacists, social care workers, nurses and community nurses will all support that patient with their care needs as and when required. The patient will have a care plan which will ensure that they understand and they own their own care needs alongside the professional that is working with them. The third aspect of the model is responsive and accessible urgent care built up through a network of urgent care services within the community that are in line with the patient's needs. Finally, there is a whole population health management aspect of the model. This is very much about the community and the individual being able to look after themselves um, through self-care management, through community support and through community activation. And what we mean by that is that the social interaction of people within their own community is vital to their health and well-being. And the model itself promotes this community engagement and activation as a fundamental part of what it means to be sitting and living within a multi-specialty community provider model. The multi-specialty community provider framework um, outlines the model of care, so the clinical model of care that we are talking about today. It also outlines the possible contractual arrangements that could be put in place to provide such a model. It is a very useful document as a, to use as a reference point for anyone thinking of developing such a model um, to support their local community. So my name is Ed Waller, I'm the head of the MCP contract development team in NHS England. Uh, first question, I guess, for everyone is why have a new MCP contract? Um, essentially, the MCP contract isn't an end in itself. It is the thing that will sit behind the care model and help to ensure that all the care model's benefits are realised. And in particular, the thing it will allow people to do is deploy money and people in exactly the way they need to to make the care model work. Why does it have to be different from contracts that have gone before? So the MCP contract isn't a contract between uh, a commissioner and a individual GP practice or clinician. It is a contract between an organisation holding the contract to deliver the MCP care model and its commissioners. And that means that there are a number of different ways that GPs and other clinicians could relate to that MCP. Uh, and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, We've described three different ways of contracting for an MCP. Um, one of those, an alliance model, allows existing providers to keep their contracts as they stand and overlays an alliance agreement over the top, um, describing how the providers will work together to deliver the MCP care model. And as you start to get more integrated in the contracting sense, a new contract will be required um, to replace those commissioning arrangements. So we've described two ways that might happen. Uh, at one end of the spectrum, in fully integrated form, a new single contract that replaces all the commissioning arrangements with existing providers uh, and covers the whole purview of the MCP service scope, uh, including core primary care. And where GPs don't want to give up current GMS contracts, an option for a partially integrated MCP contract which allows GPs to retain their current primary care contracts and for another contract to hold uh, the rest of the MCP service scope. Okay, cool. Okay. So some of the learning from our existing vanguards is that um, the relationships in the local area are really important, are really important and it's likely to be that um, MCPs will come to life uh, as a result of strong relationships between a number of partners in the local area and some of our vanguards are thinking about um, moving all the way to a partially or fully integrated MCP in one go. Others are thinking that they might want to take the step of going through an alliance phase before they do that and as our vanguards, our early vanguards, take the steps that they do to bring an MCP to life, we are going to 
record how they've done that so that uh, those that follow can share in the learning. Uh, we have a national team who are here to help if you want to ask any questions about how procurement, commissioning and contracting will work in an MCP um, and we are happy for you to get in touch uh, if you'd like one of those discussions. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Peter Bennett, a GP in St Anton-Sea in Lancashire and uh, I'm involved in the Farnham Wire CCG as a clinical lead for long-term conditions and have been involved in the new models of care um, over the last uh, two to three years. Hi, I'm Felicity Guest, uh, I'm a GP in Thornton Cleveland in Lancashire and I'm one of the clinical leads at the CCG at Farnham Wire uh, with the responsibility for the vanguard and innovation. Since the CCG started, we've been quite keen to uh, get involved in some innovative work, um, relying in many cases on our uh, GP population to um, really uh, activate them. And I think we realise that they are an undervalued resource. And uh, from an early stage, we were keen to get them involved in the CCG uh, in the Council of Members. I think this. I, I think you, you found when you joined us that this was one, one of the key strengths of the way we were working, didn't we? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's one of the big strengths of the CCG, and it's why we've been able to drive on and be successful with the Vanguard program as well as, well as other things. Uh, and that's around a lot of strong clinical leadership, both within the CCG with the official roles, but also looking at good relationships through the wider GP community and. It, it just shows that putting in that effort at the start to, to build those strong relationships, it, it means that you can deliver on things later on. One of the early ideas that we had was to um, divide our population into neighbourhoods. And uh, I, th I think this was built on ideas that other people had had. And what I felt was good about it is that it seemed to resonate well with uh, a number of our other stakeholders and partners. Um, social services, uh, the local council and people like that. How, how did you feel about it? Yeah, I think it's worked really well. It's given local GPs a bit more um, opportunity for innovation, looking at their local priorities and feeling like they're having more of a say. And it's resulted in a lot of really exciting projects that we've, we've sort of got up off the ground, really. So one great example is we have a, a care home project in one of the neighbourhoods and similar ones coming on stream in other neighbourhoods which were already having a big impacts in terms of reducing hospital admissions and improving care, reducing demands on general practice. I'm from the generation where GPs virtually never spoke to each other, certainly never spoke yeah. to the neighbouring practice, and it, it was very difficult to get any sort of uh, uh, communication or agreement going. How have you felt that things have changed? I think enormously. So, so over the last couple of years, the, the, the sort of CCG approach in the neighbourhoods have, have sort of incentivised us to all sit down together and spend time together. Uh, and now the approach is we're all looking at referral you know, rates together, and, and it's a real impetus to drive good practice uh, forward, really. Uh, and looking to the future in terms of our MCP development for next year, it, it's going to be really key those relationships. Um, are very keen in terms of yeah. working together much more closely, trusting one another. Um, I, uh, I think you make a very good point there, Felicity. Um, I, I think developing the trust, um, recognising that we have a, a shared culture, I think has been a, a, an important strength of ours mm -hmm. within the, the CCG GP membership. I think it's also uh, helped us to develop relationships uh, with, with other stakeholders. Um, I, I mean, my, my view is, is that there are sort of people in social services, in the local councils, in the housing, in the police force, who can understand what we're trying to do if we go out there and sort of uh, sell it to them. And, and, and they've been very keen to come on board. But the, it's been important to get that trust and culture early um, before getting too involved in organisational forms. 
Absolutely, and I think um, those relationships have informed all the design of our, our care models. So our extensive care service has been, uh, you know, a big part, a big driver for us, and has been up and running for over a year, just showing great results already. Um, and a big part of that has, has been this sort of holistic approach, looking at um, relationships and working more effectively with, with non-health services. Yes, the, the, the extensive care service, I think, uh, again, was one of our successes. Uh, built by very close working with, with the acute trust. The beauty of extensive care is this sort of mixed health and wellbeing approach and the care coordinators and the, the wellbeing support workers really pushing people forward and activating them and moving them on. And one of the things we found actually is that people aren't saying our service are quite as long as we'd expected and that's because they're being well activated and at the moment we're not seeing huge rates of referral at all are we? No, no, no. I, th um, I think uh, the, the figures are certainly showing that we're um, getting 19, 20% reduction in our non elective admissions, and we're seeing uh, probably a, a, an even more significant reduction in uh, elective referrals, mm -hmm. which uh, I think has been quite interesting. Many of us can talk the talk about a holistic approach and working together in NDTs and so forth, but actually organising it mm. um, can be more of a challenge than, than, we, than we may think. Mm. Um, uh, I think part of the key has been being moving away from that traditional medical model of the GP can do everything better than anyone else can simply because they've got the most letters after their name. That, that's simply not the case, even if I had the time. I don't know about all the 50 voluntary organisations in our local area that our care coordinators do. I'm not the right person to be signposting there. I'm not the right person to be sort of having the detailed discussions about somebody's diet and diabetes because that's not, not what we're here for. And I, I think that's a message that with some, some of our colleagues took a while to get through, but I really think that you know, we've succeeded in promoting that amongst the wider GP population. The way the, way the, uh, the MCP model has been uh, described in the framework, I, I think is, is, is quite exciting. Um, I just wonder what you feel about that. Mm. Well, I think the, the future of general practice is all about closer working with, with partners and, and we've, we've talked about how we've got good relationships um, locally and that's going to stand us in, in good stead going forward. I think that um, you know the, the, we know there are workforce challenges, and we know there's no alternative but to do things differently. But we don't necessarily need to see that as a negative. We can see that as a positive going forward. And I think that's what the MCP allows us to do—to have a strong community care and primary care voice in delivering services and in designing services in the future, and working um, sort of more collaboratively, collaboratively with provider colleagues. So, so at the moment we're in silos, aren't we? Yeah. Um, but the idea of you know working with the community trust, for example, designing you know working together uh, without all these sort of gaps and communication problems that we have at the moment, I think the MCP is really the vehicle for yeah. driving that forward. Yes, I certainly think community provider. Uh, uh, I think are the, the the exciting thing. Yeah. Um, there's always historically been that sort of division between primary and secondary care and uh, I think our GP workforce who would be very interested in, in sort of having a, a bit more of a handle on, on, on the breadth of the provision that, uh, that we could do. That I, I feel there's a lot of untapped potential uh, within the GP workforce and I think one way of keeping them in the job and certainly encouraging them into the job is to be able to broaden their um, portfolio, broaden their, their way of working mm. uh, and their sense of ha having some sort of uh, control of, of, of what they're doing. And I think equally with secondary care colleagues we see this artificial split but I think our experience in terms of trying to design an integrated diabetes service as well as the expense of care it has been that actually there are consultants who are really keen to do things differently, work more in the community, work more with us. And I think when you get those groups of clinicians sitting down in a room together, we realise how much we have in common um, and how we can design services around the patient which are going to work much more effectively for the population's future needs.
To succeed, it is essential that teams are supported to build their improvement and learning skills. It will also require creating cultures of learning that allow staff to challenge assumptions and innovate. This is something we've seen in the improvement projects the Health Foundation sponsors around the country. As the programme progresses, it will be crucial to encourage vanguards to share their learning about successes and failures. It is in this way that communities can be supported to change the way they deliver care for the future.